Cheto pitam chege nadare tam chege onchu ke korotam to te zum sange tam chege ko sung tu nisu ishege mo taki ge jite balde lama tamba shing le ba me ba nange sheto pensra ame ta punza kai chai gi che be gi ne ne jorola na me be gi dan dele idam ke kro ke la so ma le shing le ba me ba sheto pensra ame ta punza kai ne sung ke pa ta khando man to che chembo ge na ne be cho chong ta shin chong ge khan ro ma ma le shin le ba me ba She tu pen tra ame ta pun za ka e be ma ka la cha tung ge ge bo ne juro ge da 
ਤੂੰ ਸੁੰਗੇ ਮੈਂ ਬਾਤੁਲਾ ਖਾਂਦਾ ਕੇ ਕਰੋ ਕੇ ਸਮਾਚ ਚਾਰੋ ਮਿੰਚੇ ਕਰੋ ਕਾ ਦੇ ਤਾਂ ਚੇ ਬਾਲਾ ਸੋਬਾ ਤਾਂ ਬਾਚ ਚੋਆ ਮਾਲੇ ਸਿੰਗ ਲੇਵਾ ਮੈਂ ਸ਼ੇਦੋ ਬੰਦਰਾ ਅਮਰਤਾ ਬੰਦਾ ਖਾਏ ਜਿਆ ਇਹ ਚੋ ਦੇ ਨਾ ਨੇ ਵਾਲਾ ਸੋਲ ਹਮਾ ਸਿੰਦੇ ਕੇ ਡੋਆ ਰੇ ਟੂ ਕੇ ਨੇ ਨਾ ਜਿਸ ਦੇ ਬੇ ਸੇਮ ਜੈਨ ਥਮ ਜੇ ਸ਼ੇਦੋ ਬੰਦਰਾ ਅਮਰਤਾ ਬੰਦਾ ਖਾਏ Honorable Chief Guest, Your Excellency, Shri Kiran Rijiju, Your Excellencies, eminent scholars of the Sacred Mandrayana, distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all a kusa sambola. Miji sai tsamba chugi gebo pe mewanga da rimbo chigi uti wulu du chidin gi ga kabdina du chigi lodi tuchin khabarchin sum zombi ki tu tiya nu chu dewa chingi shinkam nale gimbo yoba migi namtu ugen guru rimbo chi chu sindu jamsoi choling nalu mitopi mi bule kutambi ki namlo mefoti ki lo paldin duba shabdu rimbo chi ngawa namge chu chi kwal holu judi jondri chi si luni ki chapsi su dibe du chu dingi ki akhablu judi be longo jibja ku yigi tu miwa ngada yapsegi kuse wantang mamese yonge kaje sinam le tindi be onchu gizingi miwa gese kutumbigi tindi pinsum subigi tukya barchin sum zombigi tukab zambo dilu ngati junta sa chide dang peldu shibju tewa ni nyamrub gi thole be jubung ni gi japjo le tindi be debu sanga doji tebigi gidegi tholu shibsel dang tudurgi tole beshina gelchigi tusok suna debe nimsungi zerimdi kendik parche kanye meba judusumi dilu nyarang yu seshuni under the enlightenment rule of his majesty the king the dharma kingdom of bhutan is celebrating a very auspicious year this year as it marks the coming together of three historic events firstly in the fire nail monkey year we are celebrating the birth anniversary of ugen guru rampuche born on the island in the sindhu lake and who is the emanation of lord amitabha who resides in the western paradise secondly it is the 4400th anniversary of the arrival of uh, shabdongong namgyal in bhutan who established the dual system of religious and secular governments third we have welcomed the birth of the crown prince the kelsey who holds the lineage of wangchuk dynasty due to the good fortune and the merit of their majesties the fourth and fifth true kelpos and the luck and the merit of the citizens of bhutan i am extremely chirgi i am extremely overjoyed and deeply satisfied that on such grand occasion we the central monastic body and the culture of bhutan studies and gnh research have funded organized and successfully completed this three acad- three days academic conference on secret bajrayana teaching chirgi peldin dubi ge khabdi nangbasange bigi temba tarwi gi chudingi ge khabchi imbi khalu sabartu debu sanga duji tebi gi chue tawi gi sanga bewi gi ne chi ngachera sanga duji tebi gi chue di chechi luichi lu sanga gesu bigi 
Chuchi Beule, Titacha Tans of the Uchi Bevachin, Tarenaba, Midenalu, Tangba, Mice, Tunku, Niba, Chudubnigi to say Lambe Mevigi to Cup Dilu, Sanga, Wanjigi Chokatan, Tapsulu, Tindibe, Mice Tunguchi Nalu, Chutar Chinsubigi, Guba Cabrachin, you being General. Generally, Bhutan is known as the land where the Buddha Dharma thrives, but particularly is also known as the sacred hidden land where the secret Vajrayana teachings have flourished. Since these secret Vajrayana teachings can, be, can help us to gain enlightenment in one lifetime, it is important that these teachings are disseminated to the general public during these degenerating times, at times where lifespans are short and time to practice is limited by relying on the four sacred empowerments and the method of ability to attain Buddhahood is within our reach. Dugya Kapdi Sangha Dujigi Tebigi Tembati Dugya Kapdi Nalu Nyan Tirab Dimbatan Gyeba Samle Gozundibe Tato Sunchegi Pan Nalu Minyamba Tarshin Gyedi Yabalu Jiri Jadibe Dugi Kecho Sugi Shipsil Na Yumidi Gulu Zamling Gyakab Jinle Chumbigi, Kyawan Sugi, Kerigle Chumbigi, Shipsil Dang Gelchigi, Tudur Dilu Tendibe, Zamling Nalu, Chirgi Nangbasangi Big Tembadang, Fabratu, Gabusanga Duji Tibigi Tembadi, Tarching Gedi, Doasimchi Yunlu, Nyakapta Tartugi Pende, Jachimbu Chunsubigi, Rewada Melamda Chikara, Kyabatsugi, Dolentang, Shipsil Su, Totudira, Lalim Tatole, Geltin Chitang, Kabara, Sangagi Tembadi, Tacha Tansubigi, Nitopta Simshuk, Kadichango Sishuni. Since Vajrayana Buddhism came to Bhutan in 7th to 8th century, it has never faced a decline and, in actual fact, flourished. As a result of this fatal environment to the local custodians and lineage holders of the sacred Vajrayana teachings, have been able to engage in extensive research. With this solid foundation of knowledge, the interactions with esteemed modern-day Buddhist luminaries from abroad have further strengthened the teachings. So I hope and pray that the Buddha Dharma in general, and in particular, the sacred Vajrayana teachings will flourish and will bring continued benefit to all sentient beings in order to foster peace and happiness, both on temporal and ultimate level in order to ensure the continuity of Buddha Dharma in general and Vajrayana Buddhism in particular, I urge you all to put in more effort and diligence to hold this scholarly discussion and research on a regular basis in the future. Tajura Temba Jinchu Pesum Gitun Le Zamling Nangbi Kechosu Tulam Jadi Siton Ketolebe Chichigi Dalwa Jadi Kadichana Seshuni Tashidele in conclusion, I implore all Buddhist scholars to disseminate, uphold, and preserve the Buddha Dharma by maintaining strong <coughs> connection with the Buddhist academic community worldwide and respect for one another. Tashitelek. We thank His Eminence for his inspiring address. I would like to invite Chief Justice, the Right Honorable Lempo Tsering Wangchu, to make his statement. His Excellency Shri Kiran Rijiju, Union Minister of State for Home Affairs, India, Venerable Lesul Levin, alums of the Central Monastic Body, Honorable Ministers, Your Eminences, Most Venerable Vajrayana Masters and Practitioners, Excellencies, Distinguished Participants, Ladies and Gentlemen. I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to the organizers for inviting me to the closing ceremony of this conference. I'm deeply honored and humbled to be in the presence of Vajrayana masters and practitioners who are veritable galacticos in the field of Vajrayana Buddhism. Given your deep knowledge, expertise, and understanding, I'm certain that in these last three days, you have been re-envisioning 
Vajrayana's relevance in the world today, both within and beyond Bhutan. I'm confident that you've had extensive discussions to deepen the understanding and continued relevance of the tradition and practice of Vajrayana. I'm sure I need not remind you that Vajrayana Buddhism's ultimate purpose is to reveal our Buddha nature, the wisdom, compassion, creativity, and joy that are, the, that are the essence of our being. Although it is so easy at times to forget this by getting caught up with our personal thoughts and emotions. When we address the subject of Vajrayana Buddhism, we are of course speaking about the third turning of the wheel of Buddha doctrine, Buddhist doctrine. Unlike earlier forms of Buddhism, Tantric or Vajrayana Buddhism did not advocate renouncing worldly activity, but instead provided a means to remain engaged in the world with both compassion and insight. Fully aware of the interdependent and ultimately impermanent nature of all phenomena. Therefore, in Vajrayana, the impermanence of worldly phenomena is not viewed as a reason to reject the world, but the recognition that because impermanence is inherent in all things, everything can be changed for the better. In this sense, the spirit of Vajrayana Buddhism applies to everyone who seeks meaning and purpose in their lives to experience an awakened state that is completely free from ignorance, greed, and jealousy. It is about finding the very essence of who and what we are, the diamond-like vividness of our indestructible innermost being. Vajrayana is thus a medium for restoring life and vitality to our innermost being. It's the path through which we can explore and recover what sometimes might feel so hidden and remote that we don't realize it's even there. But Vajrayana shows us that the hidden realm of the heart is not only real, it's our very essence. Rediscovering the true depths of our being and sharing its beauty with others is what really matters. If we want to make the world a better place for all sentient beings, I think all of us here share the aspiration to improve the world and that we are all using our talents and abilities as best as we can to improve conditions for ourselves and others. So whether we call ourselves Vajrayanas or even Buddhists, I think we all share the same view that in the process of life and death, bringing a little more magic, wonder, and compassion into everyday experience is a precious gift. Aspiring to be or becoming a compassionate and a good human being, surrounding yourself with positive energy is the greatest miracle. In Vajrayana, just to have that intention is already to begin to make it real. Guru Padma Sambhava and Khandu Ishi Thogil taught that our minds have no absolute boundaries. And in our innermost nature, we share a common goal and aspiration of improving the world for all sentient beings. In Bhutan, we have consciously tried to apply this directly through our policy of environment protection, which is one of the pillars of our national development philosophy of GNH, or Gross National Happiness. Another pillar is the preservation and promotion of culture. It is not just about stewardship of our cultural and environmental inheritance. It's about actively contributing to the growth of these assets, just as in any other field of human endeavor, from arts and literature to medicine and technology. All as aspects of human life are continuously developing. It would be illogical to think that religion and spiritual life are not equally subject to growth, improvement, and changes in approach. Because change is inevitable, sometimes we need to embrace change rather than fight it. If we look at the lives of the male and female Mahasiddhas, the great Indian masters who were the founders of Vajrayana, they all taught and lived lives of integration, and thus demonstrated the path to finding fulfillment in whatever circumstances in which we might find ourselves. 
This is not only the vision of Vajrayana, but it's also the vision at the heart of GNH policy. It is not that we have discovered a magic formula for happiness. It's more about realizing the larger goal of establishing harmony between all aspects of existence and finding happiness as a consequence. In conclusion, I would like to thank you all for having come from distant places to our deeply spiritual Buddhist kingdom, <clears throat> for contributing meaningfully to this great discussion, and for continuing <clears throat> to sustain and propagating the tra tradition of Vajrayana Buddhism. Thank you and Tashidilin. Your Excellency, the Chief Guest, Your Eminence, Lepin, Honorable Chief Justice, uh, Honorable Ministers, Your Excellency, Indian Ambassador, Tashos, officials of the armed forces. Um, this is my last opportunity to share a with, word with all of you collectively. So please grant me about eight minutes. I had the honor three days ago to express words of welcome to all of you in the midst of the Bhutanese people. Now at the end of this conference, which I hope has been satisfying, I have also the honor to invite as our chief guest today, uh, His Excellency Kirin Rijiju, Union Minister of State, Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India. I hope that uh, your experience thus far has been good. And uh, in our own simple biographies, uh, in our meaning, those who participated, this place in Motitang would have become a tiny ne, tiny holy place. Ne means eventually abiding. You have to abide in a place by being pacified, shine, uh, ne sa, ne, ne look, etc. So I would like to see this place in our own life as that kind of a place when we look back, where we have become slightly pacified towards some goal. Uh, I think the management was not too bad, I hope, but if some of you have seen me around deserving places in a wrathful form, <laughs> please excuse me. From a management point of view, I take that delay of 30 seconds in serving tea to 500 people is a crime against humanity. <laughs> so I do get slightly worried when people don't show efficiency at the early stage of democracy. With reference to His Excellency Kiran Rejuju's being here this evening, it was me and my colleagues' good fortune to call on His Excellency in New Delhi. And that occasion, like many occasions in our life, can be seen as an accidental, random, formal occasion, or it can be also seen as some sort of small tendril a tendril means causal connection, and the other side of the co uh, coin of causal connection is le jude. These are linked. So in our shared terminology, Your Excellency, there was a small tendril uh, in being able to see you in Delhi last time along with our colleagues. And uh, if I may share the uh, atmosphere of his office at that time, 
uh, His Excellency was, an of, was in an office equipped with huge screen, a television screen, uh, fed by satellite images of Google Earth. Uh, and he zoomed down on the Northeast India and Bhutan in very clear pixels, uh, uh, focusing on Tashigang, Merak, Sakteng, and so on and so forth. And I felt that his mind was focused on geostrategic issues as well as development and preservation of Northeast and Eastern Himalayas uh, from a very high overview perspective. Uh, as you know, His Excellency is from West Kamang District, uh, which is next to Tawang District, which is in turn next to Bhutan. And it, the uh, very close to the border of China too. Uh, we discussed, Your Excellency, in the last three days, Vajrayana's many facets, including uh, its colossal progenitors <coughs> like Guru Rinpoche and Pema Lingpa. Incidentally, both of them also had association with Tawang and West Kameng. Because in Tawang there is a Domsang, which was used also by Guru Rinpoche as meditation cave. And as most Bhutanists know, uh, Pema Lingpa went to give initiations on Hayagriba and Herukas in Tawang. Uh, I mention this because there is a shared history and people, from my point of view, is, uh, uh, must have some idea about history. Past does not exist except for what we know as history from writing. And if you do not know history, it is also difficult to move forward because you don't get direction. In Tawang, in the seventh century, we know from many writings uh, and our own direct account, oral account, was also a place of Buddhist story where Queen Rohazangmo, San Kintulekpa, and King Kalawangpo were located in that region which borders Bhutan. And one of their ruin of palace is also in Bhutan. This is 7th century Buddhism, much before Guru Rinpoche was here. And the area between Kurti Dunkar in our country and one part of Arunachal is also the arena of one episode of Gesar of Ling, when he comes to encounter King Shinchi Tala, Shinchi, uh, mm, uh, 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 king Shinti uh, Gyalpo, a king who was sitting on a wooden throne. Um, this is. And in Arunachal Pradesh, there is one tantric mountain uh, which is key to practice of tantra, then that is Sarine, Sarine of the board of Vajramar Hai. Uh, there is the idea that earth also has nadi and channels, just like human being. And Sari is uh, central to that idea, as you know. And uh, the uh, uh, book by Tony Huber on the cult of pure crystal mountain, and Ian Baker's book, The Heart of the World, A Journey into the Last Secret Place, uh, tells how important Arunachal, Arunachal Pradesh is to Tantic Buddhist practice. I tell all these things only to make one point. That is, because of the Buddhist orientation of the place where, from where His Excellency comes from, and because of the closeness of these places to Bhutan in history and to uh, situation now, probably caused some tender meeting between us and him last time when we visited New Delhi. 
So we tried very hard to invite him to this evening. Uh, I, I qualify hard because he has huge responsibilities which we also cannot conceive uh, uh, from our point of view. But His Excellency uh, Kiran Rijiju is also a bastion of Buddhism himself, not just that he comes from that area. And the only cabinet minister in India today who is Buddhist. And that is quite a significant point in my opinion. I am not very sure, but I think His Excellency is the first cabinet minister of independent India. There was Dr. Amdekar, but he converted only after he resigned as law minister from Indian cabinet. And his resignation followed by conversion was one also of epic scale because on that day of his conversion, 400,000 people also converted to Buddhism. In the context of high responsibilities of His Excellency Kiran Rijiju, he is therefore the singular voice of Buddhism in the government of India today. And he has made already landmark contributions, including the introduction of Buddha Jayanti, which was celebrated officially in India in the grandest possible way so far. Judge the best young parliament of 2014. His Excellency is just 45. And that gives him many, many decades ahead to shape the direction and destiny of India, especially the northeast of which he is a great symbol and a great advocate. As B.G. Burgis, one scholar has said, there is a need to interpret northeast India to the rest of India. And equally, for India to be interpreted as a whole to northeast India, and this has to be done also in a moment and a mood where worldview is changing in a very plural way. It's not it's a very uh, confusing period in the world. So His Excellency Kiran Rijiju has been playing that splendid role due to his foresight and focus on integrating Northeast India advantages, advantageously. Uh, integration is a mixed process. Sometimes it's totally disadvantaged, sometimes it is. So, but he has been doing it in an advantageous way. Charged with the responsibilities of internal and external border securities of India, in which, of course, Indo-China relationship is a major object of management and improvement on both sides. His Excellency Rijiju is an authority on India-China issues. And that issue, of course, is one of the world's most important subject from multiple points of view. The contributions of humanitarian works including disaster management, has been deeply appreciated contributions to humanitarian works by His Excellency Kiran Rijiju, has been deeply appreciated not only in India but by global multilateral organizations. And I feel proud to tell you that His Excellency was honored by the United Nations as the disaster risk champion of Asia region. What could be more important than that? To free people from fear and insecurity brought suddenly by any kind of disaster 
man-made or natural, is indeed a matter of great merit, you would say, from a Buddhist point of view, or sonam for His Excellency Himself, and of great benefit to other people. I cannot help just pointing out that there is debate within Buddhist circle, Buddhist circle also whether suffering from disaster, natural disasters, is a matter of karma or not. And there is, uh, you know, kebujebi le. This is karma brought about by personal uh, activities. Thinungi jebi le. This is also a shared karma. And indeed, even with respect to natural disasters, science now science now allows us to understand that this is partly man-made. So there is thinungi. And so there is also some responsibility elsewhere to participate in shared solution towards these sort of disasters. I just wanted to, I couldn't help mentioning this. Your Excellency, we had a very, uh, we, we had a very, uh, 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 what do you say, uh, uh, wide-ranging discussion. Uh, uh, examining Vajrayana from a scientific, neuroscientific perspective to the traditional way of explanation and exposition. And uh, at a certain point, we came quite close to uh, uh, labeling Guru Rinpoche and Dzogchen masters uh, as neuroscientist ahead of uh, two th ahead by about two thousand years, and this morning uh, there was a striking two uh, scientific presentation, uh, one from King's College London, uh, and another one I can't remember the institution, where the very very uh, uh, finest point of. Uh, about consciousness of, in terms of Buddhist analysis was presented. The distinction between Rigpa, six consciousness, uh, store consciousness, etc. And I think I want to take this last one minute opportunity to say something about the experience of one uh, adept from my village who went through cancer surgery in Delhi in late. 80s. And he told me exactly while he was being anesthetized and they expected him to not have any consciousness, he told us later that the anesthesia could not suppress his sodukki nangwa, forget about the rikpa. He could observe after second dose of anesthesia whatever was going on him. So, so, see, so he was saying that the anesthesia dose was not sufficient to even vanquish his sodukinawa, which is not rapa. I do not sound, want to sound uh, grave and serious and debative and combative. Uh, I just want to end by saying that uh, one more thing about His Ex Excellency Kiran Rijiju, and that is his role in playing, uh, role, he is playing um, a role in sharpening Indian people's aim. He is the vice president of the National Archery Federation, Archery Association of India, His Excellency. Uh, and uh, I have one request, uh, a very heavy request. It is that by colluding Your Excellency with His Royal Highness, Prince Jigel Wangchuk, who is the uh, chairman and president of the Bhutan Olo Olympic Committee, uh, Your Excellency and Prince Jigel should collude and take Himalayan style archery and make it into a Olympic sports. Yeah. 
I think it will be far less aggressive. Uh, uh, and people can try to shoot at an empty wooden target far away, like liberation target, which is some distance away to all of us. Lastly, I wish to express our hope collectively that may you get some jilap from this. This is your third trip, I believe, to Bhutan, but may you get some jilap from this trip. Jilap means basically blessing, but flooding with blessing, not just trickling, but flooding. Lap. This is a powerful wave of blessing. In a clear way, we would also like to receive tashi and auspiciousness for the Indo-Bhutan relationship from your distinguished address, for which we have the great privilege. Your Excellency, may I request you to deliver the closing address. Thank you. Honorable Leong Po Sering Wangchuk, Chief Justice, Royal Court of Justice, His Eminence Lopen Sange Dorji, Lechok Lopen, Honorable Leon Pos, Dasho's spiritual leaders, scholars, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. I extend my heartiest thanks to His Excellency. Dawa Galsen, Minister for Home Affairs and Cultural Affairs, Royal Government of Bhutan, and Dasho Karma Ura, the entire team for inviting me to participate in this very important international conference on tradition and innovation in Vajrayana Buddhism, a mandala of 21st century perspectives and giving me this opportunity to, to address this August gathering of thinkers and eminent, thinkers of eminence and erudition in Buddhist tradition. I'm grateful for this opportunity to partake in this great Sangam, the confluence of minds on the subject of continuity and change within both historical and contemporary expression of Vajrayana Buddhism. I congratulate and express my sincere appreciation to the Central Monastic Body and the Center for Bhutan Studies and Gross National Happiness Research for organizing this. I express thanks to His Majesty, the Fourth King, and His Majesty, the King, Jigme Kesar Namgil Wanchuk, the Honorable Prime Minister Lonchen Sering Topke and the visionary guidance of His Holiness, the J. Kenpo, and their eminences, the Lopons of the Central Monastic Body. And I'm also enchanted by the hospitality of the Royal Government of Bhutan. Today I had a very warm meeting with the Honorable Prime Minister and many of his senior cabinet colleagues. And of course, as uh, Dasho Karmaura mentioned about our past relations, this is my third visit to Bhutan, and always it has been enchanting. Every moment I am meeting Bhutanese people, either in Bhutan or anywhere else. I enjoy every bit of moment. And of course, the, the proposal being made by Dasho about archery, that to the Himalayan, especially the Bhutanese form of archery, we are organizing uh, an event which is known as Himalayan Sports Competition, probably somewhere in northeastern region. And I'm keenly taking uh, initiative, so I'm very sure that uh, as a special guest, we would like to invite the Bhutanese archery team to participate there. And we will have some <laughs> informal competition also. 
Bhutan and India share uniquely warm and special relations founded on mutual trust and understanding. The Indo-Bhutan Friendship Treaty signed and ratified by the two countries in 2007 forms the basic framework of our relations. It is not only the reflects of the contemporary nature of our bilateral relations, but also lays foundation for the development in the 21st century. On the religious and cultural fronts, we have a shared past and vibrant relations and exchanges at present. As uh, the Honorable Prime Minister had mentioned in his key address about this conference being organized in this very auspicious campus of the Royal Institute of Tourism and Hospitality. And I have personally seen it while coming here, the serene and soothing environment and the state-of-the-art facilities at the venue are a perfect setting to celebrate this special occasion and to explore diverse points of view within a sacred space of openness and mutual appreciation. During this conference, I'm told has been explained also, a number of speakers from different countries, which include spiritual leaders as well as prominent scholars and neuroscientists researching the effects of yogic and contemplative practices of human brain and well-being have shared their insights and experiences and also talked about the challenges and opportunities of the 21st century. The living spirit of Vajrayana Buddhism that is inherent in Bhutan's landscape, temples, arts and daily life can easily be felt in the environment of this conference. Both India and Bhutan had been ardent advocates of peace and compassion as envisaged in the teachings of Lord Buddha. Tracing the religious and cultural history of India reveals that the advent of Buddha Sakyamuni brought a paradigm shift in the cultural, in the culture of philosophy and spirituality in India and the rest of the world. His entire teaching corpus, known as the Tripitaka, the three baskets contain the ethical discipline, methods of training of mind, and the ground and modes of cultivation of wisdom with a philosophy of dependent origination and practice of nonviolence rooted in love and compassion. Buddhism made immense contribution to the culture of peace, has left a great impact on social and cultural life of Asia. Buddhism is not simply a religion, it is a culture constituted by a rich fabric of spirituality, arts, and sciences. Vajrana Buddhism, which is sometimes also known as, known by a misnomer as Tantric Buddhism, is an example of our shared past. It is said to be the first emerged in Orissa, in Eastern India, between 5th and 7th centuries. Early Vajrayana practitioners were forest-dwelling Mahasiddhas. By the 9th century, Vajrayana had won acceptance at major Mahayana monastic universities such as Nalanda and Vikramshila. Later on, along with much of the rest of Indian Buddhism, the Vajrayana also disappeared from India in the wake of the late 12th century Muslim invasions. Later on, it was wholly transplanted from the 7th to 12th centuries in Tibet, from where it has persisted and flourished throughout the Mongolian Empire, Bhutan, Japan, as well as it evolved into Shingon sect of Japanese Buddhism. From the time of Asoka onwards, Buddhism and the art associated with it had a transforming effect on the countries in which it reached. The Kingdom of Bhutan today is the repository of the glorious Vajrayana tradition, philosophy, art, and practices, and thus has the unique responsibility to preserve the same for future generation, which you are doing today. I'm deeply appreciative of that. As the theme of the conference, the tradition and innovation in Vajrayana Buddhism, a mandala of 21st century perspectives, underlines 
there is a greater need, in fact, more than ever since evolution of human history, to relook at Buddhism and its varied philosophic traditions in the current context of conflicts worldwide and mass sufferings in the name of religion, racial and sectarian hatred. It is time to reiterate and replay the important role of religion in this enormous contribution to the maintenance of world peace, stability and security. Different religions are supposed to be safe refuge for people for peace and pursuit of happiness, not only in this life, but also a better next life. Sadly, this role of religion has declined in this present age. People in different parts of the world are living in fear due to conflicts caused by religious extremism, which pose a great threat to human society. I would like to take this opportunity to condemn all forms of threats posed by millions of extremists. At the same time, I request the religious leaders of all religions, faith and beliefs to teach their followers the true essence of their respective religions so that they may walk on the middle path, free from any extreme. On the upside, we find an immense increase of our knowledge through technical innovations. Rising levels of literacy and education, expansion of life expectancy due to medical advances, decrease of poverty, human rights through liberation movement, and establishment of democratic societies, etc. Paradoxically, the increase of knowledge in the modernity did not in turn contribute to peace and happiness. The modern scientific insight and concept of knowledge simply doesn't provide answer in the way religions do concerning questions of meaning and purpose, causes and effects. Within this spectrum, the task at hand is to make use of unique potentials of religion and philosophies specific to the individual traditions such as Vajrayana that are conducive for building a just, peaceful, compassionate and democratic society as a whole and create conditions for everyone to, li to live freely within a harmonious plurality. In fact, Buddhist ideas based on truth, peace and middle path have become more relevant in the light of negative developments today. Almost all the countries in Asia embraced Buddhism voluntarily. No force of any kind was found behind the flourishment of Buddhism wherever it went. Buddhism transformed the people into peace-loving and their culture into peaceful phenomena. Given its liberal nature, Buddhism also adopted some of the cultural aspects of regional places, which is why Buddhism in various regions of Asia perceptibly reflects the respective culture. I would like to mention last time when I went to Japan <coughs> that Hindu and Buddhist uh, uh, combined sitting for the conflict resolution. The Japanese Prime Minister, in a very lighter vein, mentioned that the, the Buddha statue in Japan are always upright. And the, uh, the Buddha statue in Southeast Asia and some parts of India are always in a reclining position. It's because he said Buddha adjusted according to the places and Japanese people are upright. So the Buddha statue is always <laughs> sitting or standing upright in Japan. So that is how it has gone ahead. The noble truth as told by Buddha says that all human problems are caused by extreme greed, extreme anger and controlling these extremes is the path leading to peace. Buddhism and its practitioners thus have to shun pacifism and take proactive role and responsibility in global peace and happiness. In fact, when people in this materialistic world are adopting all kinds of means to gather worldly wealth, his Majesty, the fourth king of the Kingdom of Bhutan, introduced to the world a unique concept, gross national happiness, that is based on Buddhist spiritual values instead of material development goes by gross domestic products. And it has become Bhutan's brand image in the modern world, and I am also personally impressed by this concept. This philosophy of happiness is based on the premise that true development takes place when material, emotional, spiritual, cultural, and environmental well-being are cultivated in unison and mutually reinforcing. It would be relevant here to say that Vajrayana Buddhist view, practices and teachings will have relevance 
and an important role to play as long as we continue to experience the basic human sufferings. At the same time, Buddhism is not only a spiritual phenomenon, but a serious academic subject which challenges various disciplines of science and other philosophical schools. Therefore, it is critical that Buddhism with a sound foundation play a prominent role in the development of a culture and human understanding as it did in the past to shape the future of humanity grounded on the wisdom and peace. However, serious Vajrayana Academy studies in modern times is yet to develop fully and it needs a benign push from these stakeholders. As an ordinary lay practitioner and also as being in the public life, polity and governance, establishment of centers and institutions for studies and research is imperative where people could study various disciplines of Buddhism. Further, effective coordination and cooperation among departments of Buddhist studies in universities across the world, collaboration programs, preservation of Buddhist manuscripts, restoration of Buddhist Sanskrit literatures, along with their translation into various languages, revival of traditional teachings, transmissions, practices, establishment of centers for learning Buddhist sacred arts, astro-medicine and astrophysics are taken up in earnest. I am quite sure that the eminent delegates present here will continue to seek ways in which Vajrayana teachings of collective transformation can be meaningfully adopted to the emerging scientific and so social concerns of the contemporary world. Academic conferences like this provide opportunities for scholars to share their research with peers and masses alike and continue to discuss their perspectives with a wider international audience. The continuous dialogues between modern scientific community and proponent and practitioners of ancient wisdom and knowledge such as Vajrayana is thus extremely important for a conscious and less greedy human so society for the future. I'm extremely delighted that I'm being invited to speak and to be part of this uh, great audience. And I'm sure that you have, in three days of uh, very intensive discussion and delivery, uh, you must have come to a certain conclusion which we need to bring it into a shape. And that can happen only if we have a collective wisdom. I'm deeply impressed by the way this uh, conference has been arranged and organized and personally, the amount of love and affection which I received, it has really deep, touched me deeply in the core of my heart. And once again, I extend my gratitude to the organizers and all the eminences, scholars, those who have participated in this event, and to the Royal Government of Bhutan, and to His Excellency, the King of Bhutan. Thank you so much.